formed during the early part of the hairband era of rock music, they would dominate the 80s, selling millions of records while hitting hedonistic heights and tragic lows. Today, let's take a look at the history of the band Rat. Rat's early history began one decade prior in San Diego. A rambunctious teen named Stephen Piercy got into racing and it nearly ended his life in the mid-70s when he got involved in a bike accident that resulted in both his legs being broken. It was during his recovery he fell in love with acid and pot while also discovering rock and roll and attending shows by groups like ZZ Top, Foghat, Aerosmith, and Black Sabbath. It was around this time he started his own band, Mickey Rat, where he met guitarist Robin Crosby. The band's name was inspired, funny enough, by a character in a comic book who is the antithesis to Mickey Mouse. Chris Hager, who also played in Mickey Rat, would admit in the book Nothing But A Good Time, Stephen wanted to call the band Mickey Rat, spelt with one T, after this magazine cartoon character. He was sort of the antithesis of Mickey Mouse. This kind of f***ed up guy who drank and smoked a lot of chicks, right? He would add that they ended up spelling rat with two T's to avoid any kind of copyright or trademark infringement. 80s vixen Tawny Katane was actually dating Robin Crosby at this time and she would end up on the front cover of Rat's first album. Mickey Rat were doing pretty well in San Diego, but they would set their sights even higher after Crosby and Piercy took a trip together to Los Angeles and witnessed Van Halen play. Steven knew a friend in Los Angeles whose mom had a large room in her garage that the band could live and rehearse in, so Mickey Rat now relocated to LA and that was their new home. They would stay together for about a year and a half playing popular LA night spots like Club 88 and Madame Wong's and even the Starwood and at one point they even became the house band of Gazaris. Funny enough, one of the bands that Rat actually hit it off with was a group called Rock's Regime which later became Striper. While the band was doing decent in LA, Hager left the group as musically he wasn't on the same page as the rest of the members in the band and they soon changed their name to M-Rat and then eventually became just Rat. At one point, guitarist Jakey e. Lee, who was also from San Diego's music scene, briefly played in the band. It was at this point Piercy was playing rhythm guitar, and for a while he ended up giving it up, and Rat became a one-guitar band. It was during this time Robin Crosby actually moved down to Los Angeles, and he came from a pretty wealthy background as his dad had worked for National Geographic. But from the get-go, he wanted to be a rock star, and even asked his dad to give him the money he saved up for his son's college so he could apply it to being a rock star. Crosby soon befriended Jakey e. Lee and begged him to have him as the group's second guitarist and it ended up working, at least for a short period of time. But Lee and Crosby butted heads. Initially Crosby was supposed to join the group as just the rhythm guitar player, but as his time in the band went on he wanted to play some lead parts. Lee would end up leaving the group and of course Crosby being in the band and wanting to have a bigger role was part of his decision to leave. But another part of it was the fact that the band was really into deciding what they were going to wear on stage and that really wasn't part of what Lee wanted to do. Plus he got a gig playing for Ozzy. Rat now needed a new guitarist and at the recommendation of Lee, he knew a fellow musician from San Diego named Warren Demartini. Demartini was about 18 or 19 and he was contemplating going to college but he was told by the members of Rat that he needed to decide within 24 hours since they had gigs lined up for the following weekend. Demartini would join Rat and he would end up living with Jakey e. Lee and his girlfriend in their apartment for the time being. Then one by one, the pieces start to fall into place. Drummer Bobby Blotzer joined the group after seeing Rat play a show in LA. And while he wasn't impressed with Stephen Piercy, he saw the band had potential and another band he was hoping to join at this time was named Bruiser, but they kept stringing him along. Following Blotzer getting the gig, he would tell his friend and bassist Juan Crucier that he hated Rat's bass player and asked him to audition, and Crucier joined the band, and the rest is history. Rat soon set out to make music that didn't alienate women, deliberately referring to their early look and sound as fashion rock, while other bands seemed to be more preoccupied with leather. The band loved to have a good time hosting parties at a one-bedroom apartment that Piercy had rented near the Sunset Strip, which the band dubbed Rat Mansion West. Rat, who were now making about 50 bucks a gig, also had a lot of women and girlfriends buy them a good deal of food and drinks just to keep them afloat. One of the first bands to get signed from the glam metal or hair metal era was Motley Crue, and soon record labels were scouring the Sunset Strip, hoping to sign, well, the next Motley Crue. Rat thought they would get the attention of record labels because in their minds, they were following in Motley Crue's footsteps. But they didn't get signed immediately. In fact, it was an uphill battle. But the band's popularity in LA was steadily increasing and at one point they became the house band for the Whiskey and even started selling out other venues at the Troubadour. While Rat was playing sold out shows, they hadn't yet gotten a manager and they were getting screwed out of their paydays. 
but that would soon change when a guy named Marshall Burl became the group's manager. Burl had famously worked with the Beach Boys and even brought Van Halen to Warner Brothers. He had owned a label at the time called Time Coast Records and he would sign Rat to a production deal in 1982. It was in the spring of 83 the band released their self-titled and their first EP and they would find a good sized audience selling around 60,000 copies of it and even got some airplay in Los Angeles with the song You Think You're Tough getting played on KLOS and KMET. It's a pretty rare achievement for an unsigned act. The album also found fans in Japan and Europe too. It was in July of 83, Burl set up a showcase for the big labels at the Beverly Theater in LA, and the band was originally supposed to open for Lita Ford, but she pulled out claiming she didn't want to be on the same bill as Rat. Regardless, Rat wanted to play the show, and they soon nabbed a recording contract with Atlantic Records. But the signing was conditional. Label head Doug Morris only agreed to do the deal if producer Bo Hill agreed to produce the band. Bo Hill was still an up-and-coming producer and rising star in the eyes of Atlantic. It was by the end of 83 the band began work on their first LP, Out of the Cellar. The first song the band recorded would be the huge hit Round and Round, and that song was set to be the one that convinced Atlantic to sign the group. Even Bo Hill told the band that that song was going to be a big hit for them, despite the band members' insistence that they had heavier tunes. According to the Chinese Zodiac calendar, 1984 was the year of the rat, and boy was it. The band's debut record titled Out of the Cellar would be a huge success thanks to the single Round and Round, as well as some high-profile tours including playing with Ozzy, Molly Crew, and Billy Squire, and it soon resulted in the album going triple platinum and peaking at number 12 on the Hot 100 chart. Soon enough, the band were headlining their own shows, and of course you had the video for Round and Round featuring Marshall Burl's uncle, Milton Burl. The video was actually Marshall's idea, who felt like the band needed a comedic angle. Rat, however, never let a rigid touring schedule get in the way of partying. The success of their debut record resulted in the band going to new extremes on their tour bus, which they referred to as the Rolling Hilton. Piercy would admit in nothing but a good time that their partying was so extreme that their bus, as he put it, got crabbed out and had to be fumigated. By the end of that first tour, the band members each had over a million dollars in their bank account, when a year prior, they were barely making a living. It was in early 1985 the band hooked up once again with producer Bo Hill, but there were tensions in the studio with the producer, who ran a pretty tight ship. He'd add overdubs to songs without their approval, and at one point, he almost brought in an outside guitar player to play on the record. Also, guitarist Robin Crosby was starting to feel overshadowed by Warren Demartini, who sometimes would play Robin's parts at the insistence of Hill. Nicknamed King and towering at six foot four inches tall, his ego took a hit and he soon turned to drugs and alcohol to cope with a smaller role in the band. Despite the tense recording sessions, the band soldiered on with their sophomore effort, Invasion of Your Privacy, getting a May of 85 release. The album was a huge hit going double platinum, thanks to the singles Lay It Down and You're In Love. The success in partying only created more fractures in the band though. Things got so out of control that frontman Stephen Piercy couldn't even remember what city the band was playing in night to night, and when Juan and Bobby tried to get Stephen to curb his partying, it only created further divisions in the band. Also adding to the tension was that Bobby was nitpicking Stephen's onstage performance, and they'd sometimes even get into it in front of audiences during live shows. The tension carried over into the recording of the group's third studio record, 1986's Dancing Undercover. The band once again enlisted producer Bo Hill, but there was persistent clashes over getting the album done on a tight timeline, while the band wanted to get some additional time to refine their songs. The band also wasn't happy with the infrequent presence of Piercy, who was only really in the studio to record vocals, as he opted to write lyrics back at home and not be around his bandmates. Despite the issues though, the band still had another platinum record, but it was apparent the band was on a downward trend, as each subsequent release from their debut album Out of the Cellar performed less and less commercially well. Then 1987 arrived and a little known LA band named Guns N' Roses would overshadow many of the Sunset Strip acts who had dominated the scene years prior. Rat wanting to change up their sound would ditch Bow Hill when it came time to work on their follow-up record 1988's Reach for the Sky. They would enlist Queen producer Mike Stone, but the band were shocked to learn that Stone was an alcoholic and his substance abuse threatened the quality of the band's recordings. The band was so horrified at the quality of their rough mixes that they wanted to hide them from their label. But label boss Doug Morris heard the mixes and he soon hired Bo Hill to finish the record. Reach for the Sky would end up going platinum, giving the band four straight platinum albums. But by the early 90s, things came apart. Crosby, who was addicted to heroin, had hidden his addiction from his bandmates for years, 
but it now was coming to their attention as his playing on stage and in the studio started to suffer. As the band recorded their fifth record, Detonator, in 1990, Crosby went to rehab. He'd rejoined the band in the fall to tour Japan where things ultimately unraveled. It became apparent that Crosby was unable to beat his addiction, and ahead of a gig in Japan, Juan Crucier would find him backstage guzzling vodka, and that tour of Asia would be Robin's last with the group. Following the shows in Japan, Robin would be sent home to do a second stint in rehab, and Rat soldiered on enlisting guitarist Michael Schenker. Detonator would be the only album of the band's career up until this point not to go platinum, instead going gold, which is about half a million copies. The band's declining popularity became apparent when they returned home to start a US tour, and they were now playing to half-empty arenas. With the rise of grunge and alternative rock, the type of music that Rat was playing was becoming less and less cool. Warren Demartini would tell VH1's Behind the Music, the second I heard Nirvana and Temple of the Dog, I was like, time to change the channel for a while. The band still had one more album they owed to Atlantic Records, but the tension became too much, and Stephen Piercy would quit the group in 1992, and the band went on a hiatus. Robin Crosby, meanwhile, would reveal that he'd be diagnosed with HIV in 1994, and at one point he was spending $500 a day on his drug habit. In 1996, there were rumblings that Rat was going to reunite, Crosby was originally supposed to be part of the reunion, but his playing wasn't up to par. Ron Crucier would opt out of the reunion not wanting to deal with Piercy, and he would be replaced by Robbie Crane. The band would put out an album in 1999, but once again in the early 2000s, the band broke up ahead of a 40-day tour. Steven left the group for a second time, and the band thought about getting a new singer, and a court battle ensued in which Bobby and Warren won a ruling, allowing them to continue with the name. Sadly though, in 2002, Crosby would die due to a drug overdose, and he was said to have weighed about 400 pounds. The band underwent a number of lineup changes, including another reunion with Piercy in the late 2000s, and released their most recent record, 2010's Infestation, that actually reached number 30 on the Billboard charts. Piercy once again left the group in 2014, before rejoining in 2016. The band would be involved in legal issues with Juan Crucier, who was touring with his own version of Rat, and soon enough him and Piercy would join forces and be the only original members still touring together. 2022 is the most recent year in which the band has been active, and Piercy has admitted in interviews that he'd love to do another album with the surviving original members, but he's doubtful that would happen. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again in Rock Country Stories. Take care.